Today I'm going to give a biography of Augustine. The name may or may not be familiar to you. His full name was Aurelius Augustine, although he's also known as St. Augustine and Augustine of Hippo. And the hippo is not an animal, it's a place in North Africa. All right, we'll look at the life of then the great Augustine. In looking at such a life, it seems to me the best way to examine it is under four main heads. We'll first look at Augustine the sinner, first 32 years of his life. Then secondly, Augustine the saint, from the time of his conversion at 32 until his death some four decades later. Then thirdly, we'll see Augustine in his official capacity as bishop in the church. And lastly, we'll see his uh, lasting impression as a gigantic theologian, a man who did oh so much good and so much harm as well. So let's note then in the first place, Augustine the sinner. Aurelius Augustine was born 354 A.D., in Tagast, North Africa. His father Patricius was a typical pagan, proud, violent, and immoral. His mother Monica, however, was an unusually devout Christian. Sadly, the young man chose the way of his father and for a long time indulged a life of sin. Some of his more notorious vices include sloth. As a boy, he was very lazy in school, refusing to learn Greek thereby wasting his immense talent. This early indolence would later prove costly, for though he became the church's greatest teacher, incredibly, he could never read the Greek New Testament. He was a lazy young man. His laziness, though, was only matched by his stubbornness. For his idleness, he was daily beaten by his father or teacher, yet never repented, but instead only dug in his heels and steadfastly refused to study anything he found distasteful. From his childhood, therefore, he showed the pliability, the flexibility of iron, stubborn, proud, insolent. This stubbornness also slopped over into contempt. Though deeply loved by his mother, he mocked her prayers on his behalf and thought her every counsel ridiculous. He looked down upon her as idiotic and often told her so. Indeed, he thought all women were idiotic. He didn't think any woman could possibly advise him on anything at all. And so he was an insolent and contemptuous young man. He was also not free from the sins of deceit pride and a bad temper. He often cheated in games and sports, but when others broke the rules, as most cheaters will do, he became morally indignant and often started fights with his fellow children. He later admitted to constantly lying to his parents, as well as stealing from their wine cellar and other places. And perhaps the worst sin of which he was guilty was, I don't really know what to call it, except he was a downright mean, cruel, ugly-spirited young man. He once dug up a neighbor's pear tree, dug up the whole tree, took the thr fruit, and threw it to the pigs. This later greatly troubled him. He said, Lord, in his confessions, he said something to the effect, Lord, I understand why a man steals to fill his belly or even commits fornication to fulfill his lusts. But why, O oh Lord, did I do such a monstrous thing? Later confessing, he simply acted wickedly because he loved wickedness. Rejecting the truth, he became susceptible to error, falling in at a young age uh, with the heretics then called the Manicheans. The Manicheans were an African group of heretics. Its leader, a man by the name of Manny, had been to India. And there he'd been infected by certain ideas of Eastern religion. And he came back to Africa and evangelized the whole northern part of the continent. And many thousands began following his heresies. Which, in short, was this. 
the Manichaeans denied the one true God and posited in his place two gods, a good God who was light and an evil God who was darkness. And incredibly, they attributed greater strength and power to the evil God. And therefore, the whole goal of these people was to escape the material world which the dark God had created and get into the spiritual world which the good God had created. And therefore, they became ascetic. They whipped themselves. They starved themselves. They forbid marriage and all those other things which Paul called doctrines of devils and giving heed to seducing spirits. And so for nine long years, the young man Augustine held to these awful heresies, frequently debating Christians, and because of his superior intellect, often overthrowing the faith of many in evangelizing this ugly gospel. And so his youth was spent in many awful vices, Laziness, stubbornness, contempt, deceit, pride, temper, a bad temper, lying, cheating, stealing, and all these other things. But when he reached 16 years of age, he found his favorite sin. And it doesn't take a genius to figure out what it is. Fornication. That was the sin he'd been looking for all these years. He then relentlessly pursued fornication for the next 16 years. So violent were his bouts of lust that later in life he likened them to an all-consuming fire, a raging sea, and a frenzy. Unfortunately, his father, rather than beating him for his sins, only encouraged him. One anecdote will show the general attitude his father had toward the sin of fornication. You know, in the Roman world in those days, baths were public. People came and bathed together. Well, one day, Patricius, Augustine's father, saw his son frolicking naked with a young, nubile woman. And seeing this, he immediately put his clothes on, ran home and told his wife, Good news, dear! will soon have grandchildren. Well, with that kind of fatherly influence, it's not surprising to see Augustine living his early years in, in the most extraordinary sin. Eventually, he took a mistress and lived with her for 13 years by whom he fathered a child. And so the early years of Augustine were very poorly spent in every kind of sin imaginable. The young man had wandered very far from his mother's advice, but he could not get away from her prayers. She travailed for his soul regularly at the throne of grace. And one day a remarkable event came which occurred which strengthened her resolve to pray. An unnamed pastor came to her and said, Go thy way and God bless thee, for it is not possible that the son of these tears should perish. Very soon the pastor's words proved prophetic. For at 32, against his mother's advice, Augustine crossed the Mediterranean into Italy looking for work. There he became a very prominent rhetor, an orator, someone who made a living by his powerful way of speaking. He became a very wealthy man in this occupation. But in Italy, eventually settling in the town of Milan, he heard of another great orator. And being a powerful speaker himself, he decided to go see what the other man had to say. Well, the orator, happily, was not one of the typical pagans who dealt in the Milanese courts, but it was a man by the name of Ambrose. Ambrose was a bishop. He was a pastor in the city of Milan and a very eloquent, well-educated man. He preached powerfully, especially against all of the prevailing sins of his age. And before you know it, sitting under the ministry of Ambrose, a man whose eloquence he came to admire, the young man Augustine began feeling the heat preaching time and again against the sins of fornication and all of the evils of his age, 
Augustine was became deeply troubled in the soul. His sensitive conscience, for the first time in many years, was pricked by the law of God. He felt himself to be a sinner under the wrath of God, yet loved his sins too much to give them up. And under such oppression he continued for several months. One day, though, in especially deep anguish of soul, he walked into a garden, hoping to find relief amid its natural beauty. But he found more. Oh, so much more. For as he sat in the garden, a Bible sitting next to him, he heard a voice, which he thought was the voice of God, but later proved just to be the voice of a neighbor of a boy who lived next door. And the boy was saying, Take and read. Take and read. We don't even know if he was talking to Augustine or not. He was probably talking to somebody else. But Augustine, thinking it was the voice of God, immediately obeyed what he thought was the heavenly command. And he opened up his Bible. And there he turned somewhat at random to Romans chapter 13. And verses 13 and 14. And there, the random opening of... um, Augustine was a lot like the man who drew a bow at venture. He was going to hit the target God, at which God had aimed it. He opened his Bible to that scripture and read these words, quote, Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh, to fulfill the lust thereof. And there in but two verses of Scripture, Augustine saw his, his old life. He had lived his whole life in rioting, drunkenness, chambering, wantonness, strife, and envy. He'd come to the end of himself. And he put on the Lord Jesus Christ and resolved from that day to never fulfill the desires of the flesh again. The change in Augustine was instant. It was dramatic. And it proved to be long-lasting. He was genuinely converted that day under the ministry of a young boy who probably never met the man. Converted to the faith, the young Augustine lived an exemplary Christian life showing the most radical signs of repentance. His repentance was not a matter of words. It was a matter of reality. He didn't repent in word and and tongue, but in deed and in truth. His life was radically changed. It was revolutionized that very day. The sins that had for, for so long enslaved him suddenly fell off. Like the chains on Peter when the angel appeared to him. Suddenly, Augustine had become a new creature. Everything in his past faded away. All things became new. The lazy student became Christ's most energetic servant, finally writing 246 full-size books amid the busy life of a pastor, as well as 750 other tracts and so forth. The proud young man was so humbled by his experience of divine grace that he wrote an autobiography called The Confessions, in which he confessed to the world all of his sins, both in deed and in heart. The greedy thief renounced a lucrative career as as an orator and sold his goods for the benefit of the poor. The voluptuous whoremonger took a vow of celibacy and became so conscientious about immoral lust that later in life he adopted the practice of never being alone with any woman not even his sister. This unbridled seeker of pleasure finally at long last found what he was looking for. And he describes his newly converted experience this way. Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. He had lived abominably wicked in an abominably wicked way yet he was never comfortable there he was always restless like the troubled sea which keeps on casting up dirt and mire there was no peace for young Augustine 
the glory and the grace of the gospel still this man's heart and from that day on he could have said with the apostle I have learned in whatever state I am therewith to be content that's what real conversion is and that's what Augustine experienced five years after his conversion Augustine was appointed against his will to the pastorate of the church in Hippo actually a good sized city in North Africa Shortly thereafter, he was named Bishop of Hippo Regis to watch over all the churches in the region. In that role, he served faithfully for the next 38 years until the time of his death. Now, I suppose the best way to judge anybody is to ask a couple of questions. First, what is he supposed to do? And secondly, what did he do? That seems to me to be the best way you can judge anyone's character. What is his duty? And how well did he do it? What do you think the pastor's duties are? Well, I found at least five in the New Testament. A pastor must preach the word. He must commit the words to faithful men who will be able to teach others. He must stop the mouths of gainsayers, shepherd the flock. And most importantly, he must be an example. Well, how did the African bishop do in these five important roles? I can answer without any hesitation, brilliantly, faithfully, without any scandal ever being attached to him. Though he was not a perfect man, he did discharge his duties without serious defect. Preaching the word, how did he do? Well, he did it with untiring zeal, mounting the pulpit on an average of five times per week. And not only did he preach, but he preached well in a way that an ordinary person could understand. His was the age and region of Origen. Origen was another church father who had enormous influence in Africa. He was not exactly a contemporary of Augustine, he was a bit younger. But anyway, Origen's chief contribution to the life of the church was his principle of interpretation. I use the word contribution ironically. He thought that the whole scripture must be allegorized. That to simply read the mere words of Scripture and to take the plain meaning of the Bible was childish. And so you have to allegorize the whole Bible. And so everything in the Bible began meaning something it obviously was not. I mean everything from the gold spoon in Solomon's tabernacle to the beaver skins in the tabernacle of Moses, the coals at which Peter warmed his hands. Everything in the Bible became something else. And Origen, being a brilliant and clever man, instructed most, if not all, of the, of the African preachers to preach in such a way. And so people went, went away from church amazed at the depth of the preacher's ability, but not really knowing the mind of God. But Augustine changed all of that. He developed an idea called the analogy of faith. Now, the analogy of faith, in short, means one verse in the scripture can never contradict another. And that whenever you're studying an unusual passage, what you need to do is understand the general teaching of the Bible. For the general teaching of the Bible will give direction in interpreting any passage. In other words, Scripture alone interprets the Scripture. Well, Augustine virtually invented that idea, at least in Africa, and therefore he had enormous influence over his people. For people did not go away from his sermon saying, that was the most clever exposition of the gold spoons I've ever heard. But they went away knowing what God had spoken to their own consciences. Therefore, he was both an untiring and intelligible preacher. No mean feat in that day or any others. Well, he also committed the good words to faithful men. He turned his home into a seminary. And there he uh, cultivated ten men who went on later to become bishops and an innumerable company of men who went into the gospel ministry. He stopped the mouths of gainsayers as very few men ever did, writing dozens of books against the chief heresies of his day. He wrote a very long, in fact several long books against the Manicheans, the sect I mentioned earlier. 
He wrote violently against Pelagius, who was kind of a forerunner to Arminianism. He wrote against the Donatists, unfortunately. But at any rate, he addressed all the chief mistakes, or at least the things he thought were mistakes, in his day. And he did so with such brilliance that his works remain, even to this day, unanswerable. He shepherded the flock with great faithfulness. And as I've already shown, Augustine lived a life worthy of the highest admiration and imitation. So if these are the five things that a pastor should do, then you can say a pastor who does these things is very efficient and very worthy of our imitation. The great African bishop did these things to an extraordinary degree and therefore deserves our admiration. So Augustine was a great sinner who became a great saint, great bishop, but his lasting but the lasting impression he left with the church is as a theologian. After all, nobody living today has been influenced by the life of Augustine since he's been dead now over 1500 years. But rather the people of God to this day are still enormously influenced by his ideas. Though that body was interred many years ago, his ideas are as alive today as they ever were, and for the most part, they're nothing short of the salvation of God. If he had powerful ideas, applied powerfully to the conscience of his readers, ideas that are as old as God, for the most part, and will live as long as our Savior. He was the father of five main ideas. I, of course, am not suggesting that he invented any idea, but he systematized and sort of fathered these ideas outside of the scripture, of course. Augustine, in the first place, was the father of Calvinism. In the days of the great bishop, there was a British monk by the name of Pelagius. Pelagius had grown up in a monastery in Britain and by all opinions had lived a, an impeccable life. He was a deeply pious man, very prayerful and so on. But Pelagius, having never seen the real world, didn't understand the depths of depravity. And so he began teaching quietly until eventually very publicly at least three very dangerous ideas. He taught in the first place that Adam's sin affected no one but himself. Nobody was affected by Adam's sin but Adam. He taught, therefore, that children are born innocent. Not a blank slate, but positively innocent to choose good and evil. And therefore, salvation in the final analysis is nothing but choosing to do right, choosing to love God, and so on. Now, of course, you recognize these ideas, don't you? These are not ideas that were buried with the great British monk. He believed that Adam's sin affected Adam, that children are born innocent, and therefore all salvation is, is a matter of choosing God. Heresies often live as long as truth. But in contradiction to such ideas, Augustine formulated the following three doctrines. He didn't invent them. They're all in the scripture. But he formulated them, systematized them, published them, and with them the church condemned Pelagius and all of his ideas. He came up with the term, the imputation of Adam's sin. In other words, Adam's sin affected more than himself. For Adam stood, according to Augustine, as a representative of all men, as in, and therefore, as in Adam, all die. That's what he taught. He taught it with crystal clarity. He also believed, therefore, in original sin. In other words, children are not born innocent, but sinful, guilty, and therefore worthy of damnation and in need of salvation. And if all men are born guilty and born thoroughly corrupted by sin, then salvation must be by sovereign grace alone. A sinner is not saved, therefore, because he chose God, but before the world was, God chose him. 
He tells us that he learned these doctrines from the Apostle Paul, especially in his epistle to the Romans. And what Augustine learned of Paul, he bequeathed to every subsequent generation. Calvinism, therefore, is simply Augustinianism. And if, therefore, you rejoice in the doctrines of grace, you must be thankful for the old African bishop. Because he stands, humanly speaking, speaking of uninspired men, of course, he stands as the father of the great movement we call Calvinism. He was also the father of amillennialism. He was also the father of amillennialism. In his book, The City of God, Augustine combats the early premillennialists who were then called Chileists. The Chileists believed that Christ would return in great glory and usher in a carnal kingdom in the world. The good thing we're just talking about old heresies that died out a long time ago, huh? They believed that Christ would come personally, set up a carnal Jewish kingdom. Serentius, the chief exponent of Chileism, looked forward to, quote, an earthly kingdom of sensual pleasure characterized by the gratification of appetite and lust. Well, Augustine, being a very sensitive, holy man, was horrified by the idea that Christ's kingdom could be carnal, could be fleshly, could be sinful, or could even be uh, worldly in any way. And so he wrote a book entitled The City of God, which deals with a hundred separate issues. But in one section, he deals with the idea of of the millennium. What is it? Everybody believed there was a millennium. Everybody had read Revelation 20. But what was it? Well, he saw the millennial kingdom as primarily the reign of Christ in the hearts of his people. He thought it would be a very long stretch of time in which Satan is prevented from exercising his whole power to seduce men. And the saints, according to Augustine, are this very hour reigning with Christ in the heavenly places. He was the father, therefore, of all millennialism and a good deal of what we call at least a large section of modern-day post-millennialism. Augustine, therefore, laid the groundwork for a scriptural, holy millennialism, giving plenty of glory to Christ as a present king and reminding us that our reign with the Savior is not pushed way off into the future but we enjoy it this very hour. Thirdly, Augustine was the father of constitutionalism. He was the father of constitutionalism, which I briefly define as rule by law rather than rule by men. The foundation of constitutionalism in government is men don't rule, law rules. And that even the greatest, most powerful men must ultimately submit to law. Samuel Rutherford, 1,200 years later, wrote a book entitled Lex Rex, The Law is King. He didn't invent that idea. Augustine taught it to him. And under the idea of constitutionalism, Augustine posited the overarching sovereignty of God over all things. That God is more than sovereign in His church. He is sovereign in all of His creation. He is the Creator. He is the Sustainer. He is the Judge. And therefore, He's the Lord of every person. Well, if God is really sovereign, if the Lordship of Christ extends to every part of His creation, then kings are not really kings, are they? They're only stewards of the power God gives to them. Therefore, they must rule for God's glory rather than for personal gain. And because they're only stewards of God, they have to eventually answer to God. And therefore, they cannot enact any kind of law they please. They can only enact those laws that are pleasing to Christ. And one of the things very displeasing to Christ is murder. Therefore, only just wars may be fought. 
Now that is a revolutionary idea. Only a just war may be fought. Because historically, kings have simply fought for more territory, for more uh, subjects, uh, simply because they disliked other kings, to plunder other nations, and all of these ideas. But Augustine said, these things are all wrong. These things are, are nothing but wholesale murder and theft. He said, the only kind of war you can fight is one that is just in defense of either your subjects or of their God-given rights. Now, needless to say, if a king is but a steward of God to glorify God, enact God's laws on earth, and may only fight in defense of godliness, then the power of the state is severely limited, isn't it? Therefore, the great African bishop was the father of constitutional liberties. And interestingly enough, if I can take a quick sidebar, you'll note that the nations uninfluenced by Augustine, which is basically those nations in the East, are also the most unacquainted with personal freedom. It's not accidental that personal liberty developed in Western Europe and in the Americas, but never came even close to developing in the Far East. Japanese liberties are but a result of the Second World War. We imposed a constitution on them, said this is how you're going to live. Interesting, isn't it? Oriental despotism comes from the idea that kings rule sovereignly. Whereas Western freedom comes from the idea that God rules sovereignty and no man, no man can infringe upon the crown rights of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's constitutional liberty. That's freedom of conscience, which only those who followed the great African bishop um, Recognize. Fourthly, Augustine was the father of history. Now, that's a peculiar one to say, but it's very important. Augustine was the father of, uh, of history. In his day, very much like our own, there were basically two views of history. The Greeks and almost everybody believed in a cyclical history. You know, that's what Hinduism is, if you think about it. It's a cycle. That's all it is, going around and round and round in circles. History repeating itself a million times over. Well, that's what they all believed. They all believed in cycles. And because they believed in cycles, then life was meaningless. Whatever has occurred will occur again. It was, you were, in other words, you were really going in circles in life. Your life had no meaning because ultimately this is what you were doing. Around and around and around you'd go. And so the suicide rate in Augustine's day was phenomenally high. Well, the great bishop didn't think much of this, this uh, cyclical view of history. He studied the scripture and found that, in fact, history was not a circle. It was a line. It was pointing somewhere. It was pointing to the city of God, the return of Christ, and the glorious kingdom of the Lord and Savior. Now, if history is going somewhere people are necessarily encouraged because they're going to the celestial city. That was Augustine's idea. Well, the first four things are worthy of a great deal of praise. I wish I didn't need to say this, but honestly, the great Augustine, father of Calvinism, father of constitutionalism, father of history, was also the father of Catholicism. Hard to believe. Augustine himself said, In thee, O Lord, all mysteries are solved, and only in heaven will we ever come to will we ever understand how one man could could beget Calvinism and Catholicism, two ideas that run perpendicular forever. But he was. Unintentionally, but really. In his day, there was a sect of really godly Christians, in fact, in Africa called the Donatists. And in some places, they were far more numerous than what they called, quote, the Orthodox. Now, the Donatists and the Orthodox at one time walked together. But under severe persecutions, many of the Orthodox recanted of their faith and returned to paganism. But then when Christianity came back into vogue, they all returned to Christianity. And the Donatists said, hey, these people are fair-weather Christians. They're not really saved. All these people are doing is what's in style. 
And we won't have anything to do with such people. We believe that Christianity is a matter of the heart, not a matter of passing edicts at the Roman Senate. It's not imposed from above, but rather it comes forth from the heart of this of the saint. And so the Donatists broke off with the, orth- with the so-called Orthodox. Although the Donatists were more Orthodox than the Orthodox, if you consider Orthodoxy to be the Bible. Well, at first Augustine said, well, he didn't like the sect, but he thought he'd leave them alone. They'll just die out on their own. They're too radical. Nobody will ever believe this nonsense. But they didn't die out. Like the New Testament church, it grew and multiplied enormously. So then he thought, maybe I should argue against them. He wrote many violent books against the Donatists, quote, proving that the church is not an assembly of the faithful, but it's a hierarchical organization imposed from above. Well, the Donatists weren't very easily convinced. They had their Bibles, and they could see that all the good things, uh, all the powerful arguments Augustine was using were nonsense. So they, they continued growing and growing and growing. And so, on this one particular instance, being rather unprincipled, the African bishop was looking through his Bible one day, and in the book of Luke he found the passage which changed his life. There the master said, compel them to come in, which he interpreted as forced people into the orthodox communions, if they won't listen to reason, and then coerce them in at the edge of the sword. And that's precisely what they did. The Donatists, under the influence of the Scripture, were severely persecuted, frankly, by the Orthodox, under the influence of Constantine, uh, Augustine, and many other people. And much to our regret, that verse compelled them to come in has been used as an excuse for persecuting the true people of God in every subsequent age. You know, no society much minds a dead nominal Christianity. It couldn't care less. It has no power. The Russian Orthodox are not severely persecuted in the USSR. I'm just stating the facts. Because their doctrines have no power. They're but lackeys to the government. KGB agents are the pastors. I'm just stating facts. But the true gospel is the power of God unto salvation, which, as the enemies of Paul said, turned cities upside down. Therefore, wherever the views of Augustine have prevailed, persecution has prevailed as well. It was said a hundred million Anabaptists, Waldensians, and others were murdered in the course of about a thousand years. Protestants and many others were hunted down like animals and destroyed for their faith. The Covenanters, the Baptists in America, and many other places by people who thought they did God a favor because they got their theology ultimately from Augustine, Constantine, and not the Bible. But whatever you think, whatever you make of this one mistake, and it was colossal and should not be, should not be overlooked, you still have to say the good this man did infinitely outweighed the evil that he did. He was a child of his own age. And at that time, every state was aligned to religion. It's not surprising, therefore, that the man fell into this mistake. What is surprising, though, is that by God's grace, he walked in so much truth. And so if you consider these doctrines of grace... This doctrine that the, that the millennium is spiritual, that we should have freedom in government and no man may rule totali- in a totalitarian fashion, that history is actually going somewhere. If you count these doctrines to be precious, then you have to admire Augustine as much as any man who's ever lived. And so what are the main lessons we learn from the great bishop's life? Well, I have five or six here that I could have put in the body of the lecture, but have just saved to the end. Just several things at random. You'll, you can do with them as you please. First of all, his life teaches us to continue praying for the conversion of sinners. For if after so long even Augustine could be saved, then so can your relatives and friends. Monica, his mother, must have long thought, I'm wasting my time begging God for my son. I'm just pouring my tears down a drain. But she wasn't. The psalmist said, 
Catch my tears in a bottle. Are they not written in your book? God marked every tear that Monica shed for her wayward son and eventually answered her prayers by converting him and making him into one of the greatest figures in church history. And who can say, if any man had seemed unlikely for the Christian ministry in the first 32 years of his life, it was Augustine. And yet he was fitted by the grace of God mediated through the prayers of his mother. I trust, therefore, that his life will encourage you to pray for loved ones. Husband, wife, wayward children, parents. I hope this will encourage you to pray for these people, to keep on agonizing in prayer. Because long before Augustine was born, a man once said, Ask and you shall receive. Knock and it shall be opened to you. Seek and you shall find. Secondly, his life teaches us the value of family piety. As much as Augustine hated his mother's religion, he could never fully shake its influence over his life. Why do you think he was restless? He was restless because he knew deep down, though he would never admit it, that his mother was in the right. His life, therefore, teaches us the value of family piety. Live holily in your homes, dear parents, and your children can never finally ignore godliness. They may reject it, but they cannot ignore it. It has a power. It's got arms and legs and it grapples. Who can say what God might do? His life teaches us to put first the kingdom of heaven. For if this great man could just lay down a very lucrative career as an orator in order to become more fully devoted to the service of Christ, then aren't there some things in our lives that we would be just as well off without? Aren't there things in your life that you could just lay aside, things that kind of hinder you, things that weigh you down, anchors on your body? Aren't there such things that need to be laid aside in your life for the glory of Christ? Augustine might have been one of those compromises. He might have said, well, you know, I can be both an orator and probably also a good Christian. And I'll just sort of preach in my spare time. He might have done that. And if he had, we would have never heard of Augustine. He would have never done anything. Because no man ever putting his hand to the plow looking back was fit for the kingdom of heaven. And no man ever served two masters. If you must love one and hate the other, or else you must esteem one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon or God and anyone else. And Augustine calls every Christian to full-time Christian service, whether he's a pastor, a janitor, or a housewife. All of life is holy because God created all of life and puts you in that place in life. And therefore, his life teaches us to consecrate ourselves more fully to divine service. Augustine's life teaches us that salvation is a radical change in life. It's a radical change in life. You know, when we read church history, or even the New Testament, any part of the Bible, you discover that when people are converted, their lives are turned around 180 degrees. Radical changes. Augustine, John Newton, I could, I could go on and name people all day whose lives were just radically transformed by the gospel. And we sometimes look at such incidents with mouths open. How in the world could such a thing happen? Do you know why we so wonder at these radical transformations? Because we have so little power of the gospel today. But I have to tell you, when heaven and earth passes away, this will be true. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So have all things become new in your life? Or are you pretty much the same person you were years ago with a little church attending stuck in the side? Augustine's life teaches us to pray for the development of other great men of God who can do much to further his cause. It wasn't a college. It wasn't a collection of men who did much. It was one man. But no ordinary man can do this. One needs an exceptional infusion of grace to do so many things. But we don't see great men nowadays, do we? They're rare, aren't they? Spurgeon said, No great men live today 
And he was a great man. He looked back to the days of the Puritans 200 years earlier and he said in those days giants walked in the earth. We need to pray for such gigantic figures. And then Augustine's life teaches us that even great men can make mistakes. If a man as astonishingly brilliant and well-intentioned as Augustine could develop a doctrine to persecute and murder God's obvious saints, then don't think for a moment that you're invulnerable to temptation and mistake. Let him who who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. And so Augustine stands, I hope you see from my lecture, as the greatest figure in church history from the death of Paul about 68 A.D. to the birth of Martin Luther, 1483. He was a colossal theologian who was an even better man. May God so unite piety and gifts in our lives that we might be faithful to our Savior in advancing His cause on earth. For to such we've been called. Amen.